For nearly 100 days, we managed to successfully delay the spread of the virus by locking down the country. We've had to enter uh, into the lockdown, but now we are in a new and treacherous phase in the life cycle of this pandemic. As we can all feel it, the winter months are now here. And as we had earlier predicted, the number of infections is rising and uh, the infections are even rising at a much faster pace. A few months ago, many of us could have said that we didn't know of anyone who is infected or anyone who has died from coronavirus. That is certainly not the case any longer. Many of us now know someone. It can be a friend, a colleague at work, a relative, an acquaintance that we know who has now been affected in one way or another. We now have well over 150,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus, of which a third were recorded just in the last week. New cases are being reported everywhere and every day. We are in the midst of a new surge of infections. It is something that our scientists and doctors have warned us well in advance and we are now experiencing it. But it is also being experienced in many other countries around the world. We've always understood that as more sectors of the economy open up and as more people return to work, this is going to happen. The reality is that we could not remain under lockdown forever. People need to earn a living. Learners need to continue with their education. Businesses need to reopen so that they can survive and uh, for their staff to also keep their jobs and earn a salary. The unemployment figures that were released recently are a great worry to all of us. It is urgent that we must restart the economy after this period of inactivity. The lockdown has enabled us to do a number of things. We've been able to deploy a vast network of community health workers and to scale up the screening and the testing as well. We've been able to strengthen our health care systems by making more beds available, building filled hospitals, opening up new ICU units, and also securing medical supplies and equipment that we didn't have. And as a result, we are able to handle the rise in infections and to treat and care for those who are infected. I must, however, say that our healthcare facilities are under a great deal of pressure. We must remember that to date, many people have also recovered from the virus. So those who go into hospitals are treated and get better and leave hospital. We've rolled out an extensive public awareness and education campaign about hand washing, mask wearing, and social distancing. And we've been spreading the message that people must wash their hands and wear their masks. We've been able to implement programs and policies to support businesses and our people, and uh, particularly those who are also out of work. In the last few months, funds and skills and resources have been mobilized across society to tackle this enormous challenge. The Solidarity Fund for example, has been vital in getting equipment and supplies to our frontline health workers. 
the 500 billion rand relief package has uh, been provided to both strengthen the capacity of our healthcare system and to assist companies, but also to assist workers and households that have been badly affected by the lockdown. Banks and insurance companies are providing relief to many of their clients who are in distress. And all across society uh, have also been assisted, but many people are also giving their time to support this cause that we are in of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have done everything we can to cushion our people from the ravages of hunger and poverty in the form of social grants and food parcels to vulnerable households. I know that many of you listening are afraid of what the future holds for you in terms of our work, your jobs, and your ability to earn a living. In fact, you may fear this more than the virus itself. Now, as the Minister of Finance made clear last week, our economy will shrink, unemployment will rise, government will have to borrow more, and at least in the immediate term, South Africans will on average be poorer. But even as our troubles mount, we can see a path to the recovery of our economy, also to the repair of our society. Already we are making plans to rebuild our economy through bold and ambitious public investment in employment. We are going to focus on infrastructure, we're going to construct roads, bridges, dams, water treatment plants, railway lines and houses. And through this, we want to drive a substantial and lasting economic recovery. Working with business and labor, we are going to scale up existing employment initiatives and we are also going to support new investment and create new ones. We must not underestimate the magnitude of the challenge that we are facing. And we have to be realistic that it will take some time for our economy to recover. Already before the coronavirus pandemic, our economy was already facing enormous challenges. And it is for this reason that our economy's recovery will take time. What is important is that the work has begun for the recovery process. And we are confident that in the coming months, we will begin to steadily see results. It is important that all of us play our part, as we have done in these past few months. It has been a long three months of lockdown. We may be tempted to become relaxed or complacent, but we are nowhere near the end of this pandemic. Now, coronavirus is part of our lives at the moment and will continue to be so for some time to come. We must accept this reality as many people around the world are accepting that they must accept that we have to live with this virus until a vaccine is found. We have all seen images being circulated, and this is the worrying part, images being circulated of people having parties and social gatherings and know of instances where the numbers of people at funerals or congregational worship are being exceeded and with people who are not wearing masks. Tonight I want to implore all of us to embrace the regulations with the same vigor that we did in the early days. And I'd like to ask 
that everyone should be very conscious of the actions that we take because they impact the safety of those around you. We therefore need to remain vigilant. And of course, the rise in infections is making all of us nervous and anxious. We need to know that our workplaces are safe. We also need to know that our schools are safe, but we are not helpless in the face of this virus. And if we take the necessary precautions, we really do not have to be afraid. If we act and work together as communities, as church groups, as school governing bodies, as taxi associations, as unions, as businesses, as sport teams, we can make our everyday activities much safer. I have no doubt that we will beat this coronavirus. But as I said the other day, we have a second pandemic in our country. Gender-based violence has become a second pandemic in our country. This is another vi uh, a pandemic that we've got to defeat. And this is, there are a number of actions that we need to take, not only to defeat the coronavirus, but also to defeat gender-based violence. We must and will build a more just and more equal society where we respect one another, where we respect the women and girls of our country and children of our country. It is important that as we deal with this virus, we also deal with the other pandemic of the abuse of women and children. I look forward to our engagement. Your feedback on what is not going well and your feedback on what must change is of great help to us as we are involved in this national effort. I'd like all of us to see this as a collective effort where all of us as South Africans are involved in defeating the coronavirus pandemic, but also defeating gender-based violence. I thank you and I look forward to our engagement. Thank you.